All right, turn in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 30. We're going to finish, we're going to finish uh, the 40 days that Moses spent on Mount Sinai. So, quick recap. Moses, uh, God, God calls Moses up onto Mount Sinai. Joshua is with him near the top of the mountain, but only Moses goes to the very top. And for 40 days, God has been communicating with Moses all that this. So that's what we've been studying. We've been talking about the, the temple. We've been talking about the priests. We've been talking about the priest's garments. We've been talking about the, the furnishings for the temple. And we're going to look at just a few more things that God shares with Moses uh, before he comes down the mountain to find something really uh, unfortunate. Uh, when, we start, when we get to chapter 30, we have this piece uh, of furniture, uh, if you will, that it goes inside the tabernacle. It's in front of the veil that separates the holy place from the most holy place. It's 18 by 18 by 3 feet tall, acacia wood covered in gold like everything else, uh, and it was used to burn incense. Uh, one interesting thing about this, uh, there was God's very, very specifically says that there's never to be anything but incense uh, burned on this, no sacrifices. But on the Day of Atonement, Aaron or whoever the high priest would be was to take blood from the atoning sacrifice and put it on the four horns of this uh, particular uh, piece of furniture. Then we get to the census tax, and so let's talk through this. Somebody read for me, please, uh, verses 11 and 12. Just 11 and 12. 29 or 30? I'm sorry, 30. 30, 11, and 12. All right, so this is a black belt question. Can anybody tell me of a time in Scripture where there was a census taken for the wrong reason and there was a plague involved? Does anybody know the answer to that? King David. Who said it? And are you cheating? (laughs) That's impressive. Do you remember why he took the census? So in 2 Samuel, she's a show off, in 2 Samuel... (laughs) In 2 Samuel, David, wanting to figure out how big his army could be, has a census taken of all the fighting men. And I want you to read with me, or I'll go there if I can find 2 Samuel. In 2 Samuel, let me find the reference, 24, 2 Samuel 24, this happens. Here we go. I can't find it. Here we go. 24. Again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he incited David. By the way, in in another place in Scripture, in Chronicles, it says that, that, um, that the devil, that Satan incited David. And so, um, there's no conflict there. God used the devil to incite David, and we see that in other places in Scripture where God has authority over the devil to... uh, Anyway, he incited David against them, saying, Go number Israel and Judah, so that the king... So the king said to Joab, commander of the army who was with him, Go through all the tribes of Israel, Israel from Dan to Beersheba, and number the people that I may know the number of people. What's the problem with that? Like, why, why, what, could, what could possibly be wrong with David wanting to know how big his army is? That's exactly it. He was using numbers as a barometer to measure the strength of Israel. And God has said repeatedly before that and after that, I'm to be, I'm to be what you look to for protection. So, now, let's, by the way, uh, a plague came upon him. This is, it's a really interesting story. Uh, God gave David the option to, be, to choose his, his punishment. And uh, he ultimately chose uh, uh, pestilence or, or a plague. All right, so, so back, to, back, to 20, I'm sorry, back to Exodus. Let's keep reading. This is 13. 
30, 13, each one who is numbered in the census shall give this, half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary, the, uh, and the, the, the shekel was 20 geras, this is silver by the way, half a shekel is an offering to the Lord. Everyone who is numbered in the census from 20 years old and upward, and also this was men by the way, so it would be 20 year old men and upward, shall give the Lord's offering. The rich shall not give more, and the poor shall not give less. So, so half a shekel wasn't a lot of money. In today's money, it would be five to eight dollars, depending on the price of silver. But he says here that the rich shall not give more, God's instructions to Moses, and the poor and the poor shall not give less than the half shekel when you give the Lord's offering to make atonement for your lives. Why not some proportionate off? Why, why wouldn't this offering have been proportionate to their wealth? Can you think of a reason why God, in this ransom or this, uh, we're going to talk about what that means. I know it's confusing, or it is confusing sounding. Uh, why would God make it a point to say, rich, poor, we all give the same? Show that all lives That's have it. Been worth. Yeah, so this was not a tax in the sense that God was trying to. Uh, needed to raise money, so to speak. This was an activity that God chose to, to, to show the people that they were, I'm going to read some good commentary in a, here in a second, but they were indebted to God. And, and rich people are not more indebted to God than poor people. This, is, this was not an issue of, of trying to uh, get people to give proportionately. This was, this, the goal was to get people to think about themselves correctly. This is Spurgeon. The ransom money spoke clearly. Everyone owes God. Everyone is obligated to Him. The Lord commanded that every male over 20 years of age should pay half a shekel as redemption money, confessing that he deserved to die, owning that he was in debt to God, and bringing the sum demanded as a type of great redemption, which would in the by and by be paid for the souls. That, I'm sorry, that would be... <laughs> would by and by be paid for the souls of the sons of men. This pointed to Jesus. Ultimately, this, uh, this ransom would be paid by Jesus. Now, Spurgeon uses interesting language, and, and uh, I think it's important for us to think this way. So this is, I don't, I don't mean to startle you. I, I, I really don't mean to be sensational at all. But I just want you to realize that this is the right language for us to think about Jesus. When we think about Jesus, we should be confessing mentally that we deserve to die. That sounds harsh, but it's true. We are all in debt to God. So, so here we have this tax that was to, 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 to remind people, to get them to think about the fact that they owed God. And so it is with Christ that we should think that we uh, deserve to die and, and that God didn't make us pay what we owe, so to speak. One more quick thing about that. This money, of course, was to be used, if you read on, that uh, this is how the tabernacle was going to be built. This is how all the money, this, all this money, remember this is perhaps hundreds of thousands of people, perhaps as many as uh, a million men, probably not that, quite that many, but this has turned into a lot of money, and this is how the tabernacle would be, would be built. All right, one more quick thing. Before we get to uh, the the uh, golden calf, in in chapter thirty one, look please uh, at these first verses. I'll read it quickly, uh, and I'm not rushing through this because it's not important. But um, <clears throat> here we go. The Lord said to Moses, "See, I have." This is chapter thirty one. The Lord said to Moses, "See, I have called the name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Hur." of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, and cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood to work in every craft. And behold, I have appointed with him Aholiab, that's a good name, I would like for someone to choose that for a son, soon, Aholiab, the son of Ahissamach, of the tribe of Dan, and I have given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you. So the point is this. Here's God, for the, for at some point in this 40 days, he, we talked about in depth, 
how all of this ornate stuff, like God said, make it look like this. You know, weave this, carve that, cast this. And I wonder if Moses was like, who? Like, who's going to do all this? And here God is saying, I'm a provider not only of protection, I'm a provider of skill. And so he names these two guys, and he also says that there are other men that he will uh, equip to do certain things. What's the New Testament or the New Covenant parallel to this? What's the New Testament parallel to what we're reading here, how, how people are given special skills? Spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. So the Bible talks about the church in the New Testament being like we're all parts of a body that work together. And so... So if my gift is teaching, I, can, I promise there are other gifts I certainly, like I can't do them. I'm, I'm, or or I, I can do them, but God hasn't gifted me that way. And so this is uh, all of you in the room who are believers. God has gifted some way, you in some way, that He expects, wants, blesses you by allowing you to use that uh, in the family of believers. Any comments about that? All right. Now let's get into some more theological stuff here. At the end of chapter 31, in verses 12 and 13, I want you to listen to this language. So this is, this is the last thing that God is going to say to Moses before He tells him of the foolishness that's going on. So we're, we're right before, presumably, Moses got, comes down the mountain to, to be rejoined with, his, with the children of Israel. And this is what God says in chapter 31, 12, and 13. And the Lord said to Moses, You are to speak to the people of Israel and say, Above all you shall keep the Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. And he goes on to say, like, this is, this is like top of the list. This is, this is most important. You are to speak to the people of Israel and say, Above all, and then he finishes it, that, that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. Um, let me read a, a quick commentary here, and then I have a, a, a discussion question for us. Though in the, this is uh, David Guzik. Though in the New Covenant we are not bound by the Sabbath. And so what that means is like Paul in, uh, uh, in Romans and in Colossians makes the point that like Christianity isn't about keeping rules. Like Christianity isn't about uh, uh, the ceremonial law of the Old Covenant. He goes on to say, but the principle is still important. Our rest in the finished work of Jesus is never to be eclipsed by our work for God. When workers for God are burnt out, they have almost always allowed their work for God to be bigger in their minds than His work for them. Now, before I go any further, I want to read this again. My paraphrase. Most importantly, you must keep the Sabbath so, because you have to be reminded that I sanctify you. Okay? Going on with David here. music. The difference between what Jesus has done for us and what we do for Him is like the difference between the sun and the moon. And the sun is almost unbelievably larger than the moon. Yet, if the moon is exactly in the right place, it is possible for the moon to eclipse the sun. Some Christians live in a constant state of total eclipse, allowing what they do for Jesus to seem more important than what Jesus did for them. Now here's my question. What are things in our lives that we get so caught up in, and they're probably good things, they're probably good things. What are things that we get so caught up in doing that we get exhausted doing them because we think we're doing something for God? Meaning, meaning we're providing Him a benefit somehow. Can you think of things? Say it again. Teaching Bible studies. Teaching Bible studies. There's no problem with teaching Bible studies, right? None. Unless you're doing it to impress the Lord. Unless you're imagining when you teach those Bible studies that you're bending God's favor, His favor towards you. 
Can you think of other things? Say it again. Yeah. Just wear yourself, yourself out. God will like me more if I do this. Actines, GAs, RAs. <laughs> Dude, all right. Hey, we were there. The Lord loved us, right? Yeah. He, he was better off because of it. Yeah. <laughs> How about this one? I'm fixing, like, uh, I'm going to be careful. To, how about reading your Bible every day? There is not a single verse in the Bible that explicitly says that we are to read our Bible every day. Yet, there are times in my life, there have been times in my life when I didn't do it, I felt like I had let God down. Or I think like something bad happened to me because I didn't do it. Or I would have done it more. <laughs> Or if you're really praying for something like a new car and like, but I'm going to read my Bible every day. So, yeah. God. Yeah. Yeah. The point is this. The point is this. The church doesn't exist. Our, our disciplines, if you will, they don't exist to prove that we deserve to be sanctified. Those disciplines should point us to what Spurgeon said earlier, that we deserve to die. And God is the sanctifier. And when we figure out ways in our little crafty human minds to get confused about that, it's exhausting and it's harmful and, it's, and our kids can see it, our spouses can see it. Friends, carry out the activities that God has said to do in faith, believing that they're what's best for us. Any comments about that? The golden calf. So, this, so think about this. This is the, everything, everything that we have studied for the last six weeks, while God was communicating this to Moses, hundreds of thousands of people have been just waiting, okay? So the tabernacle has not been built yet. The priest, all this stuff, that, like it, ha, it doesn't even exist yet. God has said, this is what I want you to do, but make, like, don't get confused. It's not built yet, okay? Somebody read chapter 32, verses 1 through 6. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. Uh, as for this, Moses, the man who brought up, brought us up out of the land of, I'll just read it, Egypt. <laughs> We do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said this to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hands and fashioned it uh, with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made, an, made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and burnt peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. They have lost their minds. Right? That's what, that's what I'm tempted to think. I'm tempted to think they just needed like a bunch of me around because I never would have let this happen. <laughs> During the planning meeting, it was just they just <laughs> right. No, the truth is I'm just like these people. I'm just like these people. Look at verse 1, chapter 32, verse 1. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down the mountain, the people gathered themselves together, and then they come up with this terrible idea. What was the impetus, right? It says it right there in the first, in the first phrase. Why did the people, what stirred them to start making dumb decisions? Impatience. Lack of, is that what you say? Impatience, Impatience right? It's delay. In, in their opinion, he was taking too long. Right. All right. So listen, this is exactly the way it is today. When we think God is delaying, we often turn to sin. If, if we can't figure out what God is doing, like they didn't expect this. He's, 40 days is a pretty long time. They're all sitting down here like, wow, this was an awesome few weeks, few months, right? And Moses goes up there and then they're like, is he not coming down? We got to do something. What are we going to do? And they turn to, to in, 
a very specific idol. All right, so here's the deal. I'm just going to read some of these. These are just things I thought of. So what we're thinking about is how we're tempted to sin, how often we sin when we think God is delaying. Okay? Examples. <clears throat> You're doing your best to be a biblical parent. You are disciplining your children correctly, not in anger, but with affection. And you're doing, quote, all the things right. But your kid isn't responding. The, like the kid, like you, your kid isn't perfect. And you feel like, well, God, I'm doing everything right. Where are you? Why are you not bringing about the result that I think you ought to bring about? And then all of a sudden, it's much easier in those moments to just act like a fool towards your kids. To be, uh, to use language and attitudes and actions that certainly the kid get, can't understand and ultimately it's a, it's, a, it's a sin against your child. Your job is not where you thought it would be. You imagine that God somehow owes you a promotion or owes you more money or owes you something. And, and there's a delay. God is not doing what I feel like I should be, you know, He's not doing what seems like is right. So I'm going to cut some corners and and maybe gossip a little bit about a competitor in the office, or I might pander a little bit to a boss just to, let's get things going, God. My spouse isn't this way or that way. I thought, Lord, that, that marriage was, like the Bible says what marriage is supposed to be. And I'm doing my part, but my spouse isn't doing their part. I'm going to turn to something else to find satisfaction. And it may not, it may not be another person. It might be a friendship or a child that you have a sinful relationship with because you're not willing to love your spouse even when they're difficult to love. Or what about this one? Some of you in the room want a spouse. Some of you are not married and you want to be married. And God has said this is what dating, uh, you know, not specifically what dating, but we know things that God says are a sin in dating. And because I'm not married yet or because I want a spouse, we're tempted to, in that delay, try to find a blessing in relationship that God says is not, that's not appropriate. Probably you've thought of others. Don't condemn these children of Israel because they acted crazy. I do it too. And many times it's because God isn't doing what I think He ought to be doing. Any comments about that? Now, this is thought-provoking for me. I like to think, I don't know why I think this, but in my mind, Moses is like, like, in my mind, Mo this, like, that's not distracting. <laughs> in my mind, Moses, everybody knows Moses. Moses knows everybody. And like, you know, like, every, like every, everybody, all the children of Israel, like, know, like, his funny stories and like, you remember that time you killed that guy and hit him in the sand and, you know, all that kind of stuff. Think this through. Think this through. Hundreds, at least hundreds of thousands of people, okay? No news cameras, no televisions, no smartphones. Here's the truth. Most, the great majority of the people who are, who, who are in this camp of the children of Israel, they, couldn't t they, they don't even know what Moses looks like. Think about that. It's, right, I mean, I don't know if you've ever been in a stadium with 100,000 people. But it, like if somebody's standing at midfield and you don't have binoculars or a big screen to look at, like you can't tell much about him. And you, like that's the most efficient way that you could put people, 100,000 people. Like imagine 600,000 men plus however many women and children. And there's not a, you're not in a stadium. Like you're just... Is that like maybe maybe some of these people would have been like that's that Moses guy, and when you think about it that way, this language makes sense. They go up to Aaron and they say, "Up, oh, make us gods who shall go before us." As for Moses, the man who as for this Moses, right? Like whoever Moses is, we've heard about him, but we don't know him. Whoever Moses is, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. So Moses. They can't figure out where he is. They don't, most of them don't know who he is. 
other than just by reputation. And for 40 days they've been sitting there and they're getting anxious and they're like, we need to get going. And so they say, and this is a terrible idea, but, it's, but I want you to see that they're not trying to do away with God, they're trying to add to Him. And here's why, I, this, is, this is the proof. Jump over, Aaron says uh, in verse 4, and he received gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving, to, with a graving, a graving tool and made a golden calf. And he said, these are our guides, plural, one calf, but guides. Probably he is saying, Jehovah, this God that we, like, that's a guide, but here's another guide. And he goes on to say, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. Like, that sounds healthy. Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And he uses the word uh, Jehovah there. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offering. My point is this. They didn't do away with God. They added to God. So, so like God wasn't enough. So they didn't, they, they're not saying we don't like Jehovah. They're saying we need Jehovah plus. You see it? What, what commandment did they break? The first commandment. <laughs> Right, so remember that commandment doesn't mean you. Sh so you shall have no other gods before me. Does not mean make sure God's your number one God. It means make sure that there's only one God. Y'all, we do this. We have little gods that we add to God, to, that, imagining that they make our life better. They're idols. Now let's. Let, I want to tie this. This, is, uh, this was not my idea. This is good commentary from somebody else. Notice that apparently everybody was like all in on giving away the gold. Right? So this is what it says. Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Three. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. They were super generous. Super generous. Here's the quote. By nature... People are very generous toward their idols. Isn't that the truth? Time, money, thought, effort, discipline. Man, you give me a good idol and I am all in. I'm just like these people. I'm just like these people. If, I, if you show me something I think will help me, and I'm, I will just... Ugh, generous toward it. Any thoughts about that before we move on? Why don't you tell me some idols that you're generous toward? Hunting. Wow. In November I'm going to vanish for weeks. <laughs> really nice place to be. <laughs> Mice, yeah, it's nice. Kids, yeah. your family, the church, favorite a sport. Think about, again, I'm not trying to say don't hunt, don't take care of your kids. I'm not trying to say that because the two are equal. Right. I'm not, <laughs> <laughs> what I'm trying to say is pay attention to how willing you are to be generous with your resources towards things that are less than God. Think about how willing you are to be generous with all your resources to things that are less than God. Well, this gets interesting. Uh, just, this is uh, little nerdy stuff, but let me, the golden calf is probably wrong to picture like a, a little calf. The word calf is used, uh, uh, E-G-E-L is the Hebrew word, don't know how to pronounce it. But the, the, the word is E-G-E-L, and it's used in the, in the book of Genesis to refer very specifically to a three-year-old heifer. So the idea probably is that they were, they were um, the word egel means uh, an animal that is in its greatest time of strength. And so it was probably a muscular young bull is what they, what, what they were, the image that they were going for. Does anybody know how big this thing was? Right, nobody does. All right. Give me a minute. We didn't put notes. <laughs> we don't know. It's funny, like, I, you can find articles that are like, it was about this big, and then you can find, art, you know, it, it doesn't matter. None of that stuff matters. 
All right, uh, one more thing uh, here about it. Um, verse 6, And they rose up early the next day. Like they were all in on this feast, way too in. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat, drink, and rose up to play. Does anybody know, does anybody know what that means? Does anybody know what the, the, in Hebrew that means? This was a drunken orgy. That's what it was. Fertility cult orgy. And I'm confident, I, when I read that from one commentator, I was like, I don't know if I, I don't know. So I looked, so here we go. The following commentators make the same point. Uh, Kaiser, uh, a guy named R. Allen Cole, David Guzik, uh, Spurgeon, like, it's, this is what it was. It was, it was horrible. It was horrible. So here's what happens. Verse 7, And the Lord said to Moses, Go down, for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have lost their mind, no, have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them, and they have made for themselves a golden calf, and have worshipped it and, sac and sacrificed to it, and said, These are our gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore... Let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. Uh -oh. Right? So how, this would have been shocking to Moses for sure. He's 40 days in the presence of the Lord and all this great stuff that's been communicated. And he says, well, here's what's going on back home. And he, and he describes it to Moses. And God says... Therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. Now, what we're about to read is some of the most difficult to understand and in fact controversial scripture in the whole of the Bible, literally. This is a big deal what we're going to do. What happened? Say it again. Moses asked him not to. Moses prayed. He interceded for his people. And what did God end up doing? He did not change his mind. <laughs> We're getting there. Hold on. <laughs> right. So let's quickly, let's very quickly read this. This is, this is so important. Verse 11. So in response to, leave me alone so my anger can burn against them so I can consume them and make a great nation out of you, this is what Moses' response. By the way, if I'd have been Moses, I'd have been like, out of me, deal. Like, <laughs> kill them all. I'll, Tim's going to be top shelf. Here we go. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say with evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to the offspring, and they shall inherit it forever. 14, and the Lord relented. I'm on any other, we're going to read every translation in the room. This is the ESV. And the Lord relented from the disaster that He had spoken of bringing to His people. Other translations, verse 14. Repented. That, is that New King James? Who said it? I'm sorry. New King James? What are you reading? Okay. Let me ask you some questions. This is important. Did God change His mind about the evil of their sin? Not at all. When He was listening to Moses, was He like, I hadn't thought of it that way. <laughs> right? Did, did, did God all of a sudden go, well, I had forgotten about the Egyptians. I don't want to look bad to them. So what in the world happened? Because we, it, this is what it looks like. I'm going to kill them. God, please don't. Okay, I won't. That is not what happened. <laughs> right? That is not what happened. All right. The Bible, the Bible is written for humans using human words. Okay? The only way that we can understand this is in a human mind. So Moses 
inspired by God, recorded what he recorded, and this is all that we need to know. But that doesn't mean it's easy to understand. And I, my argument to you today is we can't understand how God uses Moses' prayer to protect the children of Israel other than, other than to say that God uses prayer as a means to bring about His will. Now, let me read, this is again Spurgeon. Some are frustrated because the Bible describes God's actions in human terms, but in fact they can really not be described in any other way. I suppose that I need not say that this verse speaks after the manner of men. I do not know after what other manner we can speak. To, this, is the, this is the heart of it right here. To speak of God after the manner of God is reserved for God Himself. I can point to lots of things in Scripture that God says, this is the way it is. And I say, but I don't understand. Like, I, like that's hard to read and understand. You're not, you're not at, like, I wouldn't do that. Right. Praise the Lord. Mortal men could not comprehend God's speech. In this sense, the Lord often speaks, not according to literal fact, but according to the appearance of things to us, in order that we may understand insofar as the human can comprehend the divine. And then R. Allen Cole says this, We are not to think of Moses as altering God's purpose towards Israel by this prayer, but rather as carrying it out. God intended to be merciful. And God, knowing that Moses was going to, like, so, like, God did not, God did not do anything other than what he said. God said, I hate their sin. I'm going to destroy them. There's going to be a punishment. Now, in the next, listen to this. We're going, we're going all the way to the end of the chapter real quick. This is verse 30. The next day Moses said to the people, you have sinned a great sin and now I'll go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So God has relented of destroying them all. But now, we're, now Moses, is talk, the next day, is talking about atonement. That is, can God forgive this? Can, can He pass over this sin? So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people have sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. Here's what God says, verse 33. Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now go lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angels shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. There was still a huge punishment for this sin. Do you know what it was? The entire generation was forbidden from going into the promised land. If you were an adult you didn't get to see the promised land because you participated in this. Furthermore, in the fullest biblical principle, everyone who, who, who was like, if this sin wasn't atoned for in Christ, they went to hell. Now, let's look at one more thing. What does this teach us about our prayers? When you pray, what do you think you're doing? Do you think you're sharing information with God that He doesn't know? When you ask God for something that you think you need, do you assume that you know what is needed? Or do you pray with humility, understanding that like Moses, like some of the stuff that Moses prayed, again, I, I feel like I'm cautious to even say what I'm about to say, but some of the things Moses prayed God had to hear it and go, like, who do you think you're talking to? Like, what are you trying to convince me of? Who do you think I am? Now, that wasn't God's attitude. But I'm saying if, if we turn God into a human, this is, I'd be like, I know all of this, Moses. I have a heart of mercy, and I hate sin. And I'm going to be merciful because that's my nature. But I still hate the sin. We're going to have to deal with this. And I wonder if Moses, like, again, I'm, I'm, this is not explicit in Scripture, but did Moses get through and go, I just turned God around. I literally turned the boat around. God wanted to go this way, and He went the other way. I, I sound like a broken record, but y'all, we can pray like that. We can pray imagining that we're trying to convince God to do something that if we weren't in there, like, do you know how bad I need this? 
Do you know what it would be like if they died? It's like an nth of a percent of when, like, your kid is trying to, like, it's like, hey, go whatever. <laughs> right. Can it's I like, stay out till 1130? Like, well, I was thinking, you know, <laughs> or whatever, and you're just like, shut up. You know, you know, What we see, it's exactly right. What we're seeing here is an omniscient, omnipotent, all-knowing, perfect-willed father interacting with a fallen, well-intending Moses. And all we know is that God, if, if Moses had not prayed that prayer, God would have destroyed every one of them. That's all we know. And, and in human language, God relented. God chose not to do what He said He was going to do. This is really common in Scripture. Jonah, right? Think about it. Forty days, y'all are all going to die. And if they had they not repented, every one of them would have died. Because that was God's Word. To us, when we read the New Testament, we see things about uh, the unrepentant being Listen, had, I not, had God not given me repentance and grace, I would go to hell. That's what the Bible says. God didn't decide something about me that he, I didn't show him something. He didn't go, oh, that Tim, turns out he's a good one. That's not, that's not the way all this works. We are dealing with a God who exists infinitely above our understanding. Prayers make a difference, but we don't change God's mind. Any comments about that? I think that like God didn't God didn't relent in the fact that like ultimately like he like his anger, his wrath will burn hot against sinners and will consume them. Like it's it's really just a like a forbearance, right? Like it's like God's perfect wrath. think of it in terms of like, well, God didn't punish them then, but he will eventually. But like God doesn't operate like that. Right. So so, it's, a, it's a big thought, but like it is not. Yeah, Cole, uh, so some other commentary, I don't have it to read to you, but the point is like, to, I think you're making this point ultimately, or the end of, the if we continue that thought, here's what it is. God said, I'm going to show mercy to some. And I'll, their sin, this sin of worshiping this golden calf will be taken care of on the cross by Christ. And if they don't repent, then my wrath will burn forever against them. It's the case with any sin. So, Tim, if you're reading the Bible, like, you're reading the Bible, like, um, so the new, uh, I can answer the question. Read several translations. Read good commentary when there's confusion like that. There's some stuff we don't need commentary for. Um, when you let's, uh, I'm asking you to do a hypothetical with me here. Like I know you don't believe that God was like, you know what, Moses was right. I'm gonna do something different than I thought I was gonna do. So when you uh, when you read that translation, do you stumble? Like do you go change his mind? I don't know. I don't know about that. Okay. 
And that is what happened. That is what happened. Like the way you just said it was actually a pretty good, he prayed and God did something different than he said he was going to do. But not, uh, was God, did, did, God knew Moses was going to pray that. Did, did God's will change? Yeah, so back to the, the, so this is R. Allen Cole again. We are not to think that Moses is altering God's purpose towards Israel, but rather is carrying it out. God intended from the start to be merciful toward this people. Like God's, God's threat of wrath should drive us to repentance, and that's exactly what it did in, in this case. God warns, you know, the Bible's filled with things that God says, if you do this, I'm going to punish you. And I still do them, and to varying degrees, God relents. God doesn't get me what I deserve, and ultimately, in the end, they'll either my sins are either paid for in Christ, as the perfect intercessor, if you will, or they're paid for in hell under God's wrath. My answer to your question, it's a good question. Here's my answer. <clears throat> the translations... So they're, they're, if you pick up a Bible, there are translations and then there are paraphrases. Okay, The New Living Translation, which I read sometimes because it's really helpful, um, is right on the verge of being a paraphrase, meaning it, takes very, it uses very contemporary language sometimes. The scholarship would be this. What word, what's the word that the... New Living Translation people are trying to put into terms that we can understand. And the word is not something that, it's not changed his mind, it's changed his direction. It's changed his direction, not his mind. Innocently, I don't think the people who wrote the New Living Translation, or, or I don't think the people who, who edited that said, you know what, God wasn't sure what he was going to do, but Moses straightened him out. Like, I don't think they did that. I'm much more comfortable reading the New American Standard Bible, the English Standard Version, the ESV, or one of the new Christian translations like Holman. That's what I'm comfortable reading. And, and because they're word for word, you avoid some of these snafus, if you will, where we try to like make a thought out of it. They don't read as well, quite honestly. It's easier to read the New Living Translation, but there are places where these kind of problems show up. So multiple translations, um, good commentary. This is, I mean, it's a hard one to figure out. But also, it is very hard to figure out. Like, that's what Christ does for us. And, like, standing on the cross when he's, like, praying and he was forgiven so many times for me. And when you learn in Romans how he talks about how, like, he intercedes, the Spirit intercedes for us. Mm -hmm. Like, right, you know, Christ intercedes for us. When we don't know what to pray. Right. He, right. I mean, it's not the same thing, but it's, it's also the same. It's just like it's, I feel like some of the foreshadowing, like with God's plan. Yeah, and, it, and, and that's the, my final notes today are that, that all of this points to, but I want to read one thing real quick. Uh, I know we're late. Okay, real quick, real fast. Aaron's response is just solid gold here. This is what Aaron says. This is verse 21 of 32. So chapter 32, verse 21. Mo Moses confronts Aaron. What did this people do that you have brought such great sin upon them? And Aaron said, not, let not the anger of the Lord burn hot. You know the people, they're set on evil. For they said to me, make us gods that you shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what's become of him. So I said to them, let any who have gold take it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it in the fire, and out came this calf. <laughs> That's his response. Like, dude, I mean, I just took the gold, and the calf appeared. Maybe God, it's a miracle. God made the calf. And we had just read that he literally, fought, like, apparently this was his, his doing. All right. My point there is, even, uh, this, Aaron was an important guy, and it, like, Really important people say really dumb things. That was a really dumb thing to say. Um, ultimately, here's what happened. Moses took the calf, ground it up, put it in the water, made the people drink it. That's what he did. 
and that was their short-term punishment. And uh, thousands of people were killed because this happened. God's, God's anger did burn. And ultimately, for those people who were uh, looking toward a Savior and repented of their sin, Christ paid for this sin of the golden calf. And for everyone who didn't, they went to hell. Praise the Lord that He has put in His perfect plan intercessors for us. My wife praying for me. I don't understand how this happens. How is it that God says, I'm going to use Mary Margaret's prayers to bless Tim? Our prayers for our children, our prayers for our spouses, our prayers for our enemies. We can't say that prayer changes God's heart or will or willing to be merciful, uh, His willingness to be merciful, but we can say that God uses prayers in a real way to bring about His will. So we should embrace prayer, but think of it correctly. Yes. Yes. Nineveh. Um, no, no, don't make that face. Don't make that face. What if God had said this, because this was true. Leave me alone so my anger can burn against them. But if you'll pray for them, I'll give them mercy. That's exactly what God knew, right? But God just didn't tell us everything He knew. There's no problem with this passage of Scripture we're reading, or anywhere else for that matter, where we run into this conflict, if we knew everything that God knew. The problem is when we think we, like God doesn't tell us everything. That's what my footnote said. It said that God said that anticipating yeah. Moses. Like, whoa, 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 hey, pump the brakes. God wasn't like, man, I hope you pray, Moses. Yeah. Y'all, there's so much Mexican food waiting for us. This is going to be quick. But we sang about this this morning, too. I was in the nursery. I don't want to bring attention to that. So, uh, Revelation 8, verses 3 and 4. And another angel came and stood at the altar with his own censer. And he was given much incense to offer with the praise of all the saints on the golden altar before God. And the smoke of the incense with the praise of the saints rose before God from the throne of heaven. And to me, we, we just we just got done studying about the tabernacle and the unclean tent and seeing how it's all in God's sovereignty that He hears our prayers and wants us to be a part of His plan. Just like He, he just He gave the Israelites God's people to worship Him. He gave the tabernacle. He gave these different rituals and now He gives us Christ. It's all, you know, it's just, I can't understand it. But like, our prayers are they please him. Yeah. I don't know. It's a lot to take in, but. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, it is. I just think of like free will. I think of our responses to God in the midst of all of these different situations. And then at the end of the day, in the midst of embracing all the embracing things that we've got. None of them are perfect. Then, None of them are perfect. One of the most, so I said it earlier, this is one of the most difficult, like this is an important point in the Bible where theological directions are chosen. Do you believe that God is sovereign or do you believe that God is open to different ideas and God is sovereign? This is the, teach, this is the full teaching of the Bible. God is sovereign. Moses did not, I'm not picking on you, change God's mind. The, 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 coal, the coal quote is so important. Prayer didn't alter God's will. It was a part of God's will, right? This is how God's will was brought about. I promise I know it's difficult. God, thank you. We're praying. God, thank you very much for <clears throat> all of these minds in the room. Lord, for the way that comments and, and things that we bring into the class that we've learned elsewhere uh, help us, help sharpen us and, and uh, provoke us to thoughts. Lord, we have to trust our thoughts to you. Uh, and when we get to places like this in Scripture, Lord, I'm, I'm so thankful for, for men who are versed in Hebrew and who know more about the Bible than all of us put together, who can uh, point us to God-honoring truths and help us make sense uh, of this even when it seems confusing. And God ultimately academia and knowledge is not what we're after. Father, here's, here's where this, so, your sovereignty drives us to this place. That you would have been right to have chosen to send me to hell. You would have been right to have chosen not to give grace toward me. You would have been right to have kept me from being repentant. And Father, all the goodness that I find in my life because of your holy presence is your doing. I can make no claim to deserving any of it. Father, help that be our thought when we think about your sovereignty and your, your power over all things, especially over us. Amen.